the policies that are available, what has been done, the known unknowns, the knowns and the unknowns, what has been done, what hasn't been done, what is working, what is not working, and why. And when we, are, we will be analyzing that, we shall make it gender, it will be gendered, it will be gender sensitive. And we shall also want to capture the voices of the youth in this. Then, we would like to pilot strategies of inclusive mechanisms. After listening to the youth, and uh, from even what we have discussed this afternoon, you may, everyone has come up saying that the youth were not involved. The strategies that are available, the policies that are there, youth are not involved in deciding them or designing them. For example, uh, in Kenya, we have a very good and nice policy on empowering youth, but that uh, policy ends up not empowering youth, but uh, making them feel disillusioned because they cannot afford to actually supply or to supply the, the goods that the government is expecting them to do. Now, when they are given startup capital, there are other taxes, small taxes here and there, that make it difficult for them to penetrate. When they try to go into informal, uh, informal um, livelihoods. Uh, they are also frustrated because these are graduates who are studying, hoping to get dignified jobs. Then they have to stand in the sun the whole day or run in the streets at night. Like right now, they are about to parade their, their, th their wares on the streets so that as people leave work, they can buy for them to earn a living. That frustrates them and angers them. And as if that is not enough, they are followed up by the government uh, looking for, they are the ones who gave them the startup capital, but at the same time, they are following them again to give them out. That makes it difficult for the youth. They can't lead a decent life. They have to maybe share a bed seat or six people, uh, and that, those kinds of things. They, they, when they go to, like the construction, uh, those who are in construction industry, even for them to be member, to go and work that day, they must bribe somebody, a foreman, who will give them uh, who, a middleman for them to get that. So these kinds of things are making youth angry. Now we want to see, uh, maybe they will tell us how they want this reshaped, how they want this policy uh, repackaged to fit their needs. Because the government has good intentions there. But then the way it turns out again, it ends up not uh, meeting the needs of the very youth. So what inputs uh, are there for us to, to achieve our objectives? Several inputs have been given to us and these include effective donor investment, IDRC has funded us, but we are here looking for matching funds so that we can be able to accomplish what we would like to do. All of you have already said when the professor presented that it is an ambitious project. Yes, in that ambition, we called you here so that we can partner to ensure that we achieve the final goal. Uh, we are having the inception and planning workshop, which will end on Friday. We will have a research methodology workshop for capacity building the research team. Then the desktop research, research field study. Uh, there will also be development of delivery of training manuals on CBE. We are going to have the writing of research evidence papers for Kenya and Uganda. Uh, in the morning, I told you we'll call this a rep. Research evidence papers, where we shall present the case as it is, the voices of the youth as they have said them. We want to capture their voices verbatim and even do commentaries. Um, if those who will accept, 
we shall take videos of them. Those who want their faces covered or whatever, they will advise us accordingly. We have already sought that kind of permission and we have been accepted. And we shall also have national policy dissemination workshop. Just as we are here today requesting for your inputs into this research, when we, uh, where after we have um, done the knowledge harvesting on, uh, by the research evidence papers, again, we shall call you to give you the evidence, what they have said, we share, you get to know what is being said out there. Uh, we shall develop a learning alliance curriculum and a radio program uh, and also some social media uh, products that the youth will share and learn from. Now, this will be structured. The kind of social media program we intend to have will be whereby we will have an open platform for youth who, uh, uh, for, for youth that we shall whom would have targeted and the others who would like to contribute, we shall be giving them questions every week. They will respond to those questions. Summaries of what they have said will be captured. And then after that, we write a report and share again. So that we keep on building onto that and share with the relevant stakeholders. Uh, where they have talked about sensitive things, I think that is why we need government here, that's why we need the police and all this. We, they will also be part of that platform. We shall not be doing this without, uh, without the policy makers, security, uh, CSOs, and the, the IGAD and all this. We will work together, as I say. <clears throat> we are using a, a tripod approach in this research. A tripod approach whereby we have academia, media, we have academia, we have uh, CSOs and policymakers. The media are the top, they, they, they are the ones who bring the fire in to make sure that things are going the way they are. And we also know that there is no way we will do a good job today without employing ICT. So, Every, every, that when we are talking about youth or relating to youth, and not even youth alone, even for intergenerational relationship, uh, the things that we cannot voice, sometimes we can write. We shall also have an international knowledge sharing conference on CVE, which Prof uh, talked about that the IGAC have said that they are also having a similar one, and so we shall see whether to collapse these two together or whether ours will come before theirs or after theirs. We will see what happens. And then finally, the end line survey. What outputs are going to come out of this? Uh, the outputs that are going to come out of this, we've already talked about them. The, we have the baseline survey reports, inception re re reports, <coughs> refining the research tools, uh, we will have a fact sheet on government interventions targeting CBE, and I would urge um, uh, Mr. Makoti to share with us all that the all the researches that they have done. When I come back, when we will be going to the field, uh, we will look at what works, what does not, and why. We shall document all this. We will have financial reports research uptake communication strategy. We will have a project flyer, which we have already developed one. This, the, we already have the flyer here, but it is going to improve with the time. Uh, we will also, uh, we have the uh, project theory of change, which I'm sharing with you right now. We are going to have videos. You can see he's already taking the videos and they will be on our portal, on our partner's portal. And even if uh, NCIC tell us where to take, we will also share with them. Because in this research, we would like it, whatever we generate, to be on an open platform for everybody to learn, unless we are advised otherwise. Uh, we have taken several photographs, I'm sure. They must be floating already somewhere. 
uh, the research team will be trained in CPE research. We, the research team has already been trained by IDRC, but then we are going to get an expert or experts who have special knowledge on CBE, who have knowledge on CBE targeting the youth and who have been doing this research on the continent. We have already started contacting them and we are uh, moving well. Uh, we will also, from this research training, the research training, there will be a research training curriculum that will be used to train us and it will, be, it will remain, which will be shared among the partners. They can also uh, do that kind of work because uh, like here in Kenya, let us say we get an expert who lives in the UK, we will share whatever would have been, uh, what, what would have, that knowledge. Because if we, the more we share, the better. Because this is not something that anybody can hold that kind of uh, information to themselves. Uh, we will also have impact stories by youth and their families. Already these impact stories are being told here by people who are saying about this, uh, how they like this research, or how it is an intervention. And you also have your own perspectives about what it is. Uh, we are going to develop policy briefs from the research evidence papers and comparative evidence papers, uh, infographics, uh, animated videos, uh, the training manual. We will share, uh, have these slides that we are developed, uh, shared on our portal. Uh, we will also have journal articles developed by the academia. We will also have the project midterm review report and the Learning Alliance curriculum. Um, the radio program also will be structured just like the, the Learning Alliance or the social media um, questions that will be sent out. Then we shall have gender disaggregated data on youth engagement in CVE. As far as outcomes are concerned, we hope to have human rights supported and protected activities on youth. Human rights protected uh, and supported activities uh, for youth because that is one of the reasons that the youth have complained about that they are maybe being targeted, there are stereotypes about them, they have been mistreated by security forces and this kind of, and, some, and their families have been harassed, even when they are not wrong. But we also know that we have those who are uh, lawbreakers. <clears throat> we intend to finally achieve an adoption of a bottom-up, top-down approach to CVE in Kenya and Uganda. would like youth participation and engagement in CBE process at all levels. Would, um, at the end of this, the African institutions would, uh, capacity would have been built in CBE. It is not only the three. All of you who are here have come from different institutions, even those who are here in the morning. They have come from different institutions and their capacity will be built in countering violent extremism. Most of the stories that have been written about uh, Kenya or Uganda or Africa generally on TV have been written by people who are not Kenyans or, 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 or Ugandans or people, it's not about the research that has been done uh, by the real Kenyans. So the story comes out differently from what the Kenyans really know and that's what we would like to do. Uh, the gender, we would like to have gender policies, strategies, and programs targeting youth in Kenya and Uganda. It's not like we do not have these policies, they are there. But then we, if we can, our research can uh, add a voice and fill a gap in knowledge on those policies, then we would have made a difference. We would like to have specific factors influencing youth engagement in uh, violent extremism documented because they have been generalized. 
as we have been saying, many times people think, look at it from the religious point of view or the economic point of view. But we are seeing that the dynamics of CBE, the dynamics of violent extremism, are so deep that we are still uh, thinking about it how best or what is really happening. It is a puzzle, actually, for now. We also hope to target communities, government, and ac academia to make them aware of ways of engaging youth in countering violent uh, extremism, by, uh, countering violent extremism activities. Universities are having a rough time. Schools are also having a rough time dealing with this. If you, we, I have had uh, an engagement with um, Dean, uh, DVC, academics, student affairs, um, um, the, the, the deans of um, students in these universities, and there are those pockets of violent extremism whereby they are thinking, they are, they are wondering what to do. So if we get this knowledge, when we hear from the youth, it is easy for us to work with these government bodies, with the schools, with the universities, uh, institutions of learning, and even to make, sensitize the parents, come up with a program to sensitize parents about what is happening as far as violent extremism is concerned. Um, of course, we will use the, U, the ICT to, or media to hear the youth and strengthen multilateral collaboration. We have already started. In as much as I haven't talked to you from GIZ, I know that um, by the end of today, we would have already struck rapport and be moving forward. So that is the, there'll be multilateral collaboration now that you're supporting Peace Network, our partner, and you're working on this area. We're already working together and we shall expand that collaboration. Then uh, we also intend that at the end of it all, governments implementing gender and youth friendly policies for CVE. The outcomes are very many. I had already mentioned them. In fact, I'm seeing like some of them are repeated, but would like to revise public policies targeting youth to include their voice and to give them space. As we have said, the youth feel that they are left out. They are dictated to terms. They don't, their voice is not heard. Would like to strengthen the partnership between government, CSO, and academia. The relationship between government and CSO has been problematic for a very long time. Uh, in most cases, they are, CSO feel that they know, and they, they are always looking at government and pointing fingers at them. The government feels that they, CSOs are also uh, wrong and they are looking for mistakes in them. Now, academia, on the other hand, the, the government always feels, the, the policymakers always feel that they talk to themselves. Nobody understands what they are talking about. So we want to present this knowledge that we are going to gather in palatable ways whereby it will be useful to the public because it is the public that is suffering. <coughs> Um, we would also, at the end of it, we hope to develop a holistic and integrated approach in examining, understanding, addressing the challenges facing youth encountering violent extremism in different contexts for a violent, free youth population of the IGAD region. Yes, it is ambitious. But that is our wish, it's our passion. And we are calling up to you to support us to achieve this great goal. Thank you. My focus had been to, to see what exactly uh, would be improved in that. He was, talk, he was talking about contextualizing that question, the factors uh, that actually contribute to um, uh, countering, I mean, violent extremism. Uh, I, I see that as a very important question, and uh, of course, I think briefly it came out that uh, in the presentation that uh, Trofina was saying that we we might we are doing a comparative study, but our cases uh, that are selected is one is from 
two different countries, and then two from within the two different countries, we have different locations. And within those different locations, the context vary. Some areas have very uh, imminent uh, cases, others are hidden. So the context even from within are very difficult. So I see that uh, the, the question that Dr. Genga was uh, raising in question one was very, very important. Uh, but I think he, he gave us an idea about how the media can help us uh, in terms of empowering and representation. And probably what is missing that is participation. So maybe we will go back and look at that. And then what policy recommendations will come from that? And I think on the policy part, Trofina has, has presented it and uh, uh, it captured that. Many questions came about these issues of uh, not all extremists are violent. And many people reacted to that uh, comment. The definition of extremism, not, not all extremists are bad. Yes, I agree with that. Not, ex not all extremists are bad. I gave an example, but maybe not a very clear example. Uh, and uh, we talked with my brother here about the vegans. And uh, vegans can be very violent. Vegans can also be very uh, peaceful. So same with religion. Religious groups can be very extreme, but without violence. So in the, in the background paper, I mentioned something about the, the, the birth of extremism uh, in the 16th and the 18th century from the Protestant church. That is how it started. But it was not at all violent. Fundamentalism, that started with that. Um, do you have research permit? I think that was, was already answered. We, we do have. And somebody said about gender, Mr. Otieno, I think he's gone. We have captured uh, the, the gender dimension very widely, uh, even in this background paper. And um, the sample counties, we have decided, yes, we have now decided that we have to look into Nairobi. But exactly where, we'll discuss that. So, and which one to drop, or if we have the money, we can have five areas, uh, okay. Things like sample size, prof, sample size, how to locate violent extremists, correlation. Uh, within the correlation, uh, one of the things I've actually thought about is we will do correlation. At the same time, we are also going to do triangulation. We are going to do triangulation in many ways. One, the methods, the qualitative and quantitative. Secondly, the, the data. So if there will be need, we will see the triangulation in many ways in such a way that we could see the divergences and convergences. So I think that is uh, what we are. Issues of partnership and to start on a good footing, um, I think I will leave that to Trofina to talk about Part partnership arrangement. It has a, a whole range of other things that we need to discuss, both in public and maybe only with the partners. Um, mentorship. There are other areas that I'm also trying to see, units of uh, of uh, research, if we could have access to prisons and uh, police cells where some of these suspects are probably detained or convicted. I don't know how the government, the government of Uganda is responding to my emails about that. They, would, they may have, tell us to have access to go to prisons and talk to some of these people. And uh, I don't know how good it will be and how we can frame that either interviews or focus group discussions if there are many within the prison cells. So we also intend to talk to those who are convicted, whether they will say we're not going to inter in interrogate them, we're just going to talk to them in terms of research. So I think uh, the different things that I've not seen really, but it came very clearly in the presentations are the different solutions, different protocols, different uh, frameworks from UN to local, and it looks like from the national, uh, all what is being said is about non-inclusiveness of youth in designing, formulating, designing, and also in the implementation of those policies. The Uganda Youth Policy is very beautiful, very nice. And I think it was launched just a few months ago. But the youth immediately came in the street to burn it down. They were te tearing it down. And it's just the youth policy, which <laughs> they say yes. And this last one month ago. So I was very much 
um, surprised to hear you also in Kenya saying, yes, the Kenyan youth policy is very good, but it is not speaking to the youth. So our question, our, our concern here now is to investigate why. If we have those policies, but why is it not actually answering and talking to the heart of the youth? What is missing? So um, I think that is my contribution. And uh, yes, I've learned a lot also. And then the campus community, uh, the university community, the students. Um, I don't know how to get these street, street children and uh, those who are homeless sleeping in the streets. I don't know how to do this yet. Uh, but these are all people who can talk to. Thank you. Disciplinary approach and an interventionist approach to research. And that being our new approach, uh, I had to look for uh, partners who will help us execute this when we received the call. And after I wrote, a friend directed me to uh, Mr. Sam Owando, and uh, he was responsive very fast, and we already agreed that let us move on and submit the call. We didn't even sign an MOU at that level. We just agreed that let us try. Somebody very, very positive. I really thank you for that. I also um, talked to Mr. Simon, uh, Dr. Simon Nyambura, of this, uh, who is now the director of the Center for uh, Center of Excellence for Countering Violent Extremism, based in Djibouti. Uh, we, uh, in IGAD. And he accepted and said, go ahead, I will be there. So we sent out the call and after about a month, we received good news that the proposal had been, the, the concept had been accepted, we may develop the full proposal and uh, the members of the team may come for, for training. IGAD is on board. IGAD is on board, and if they were not, we wouldn't be here. They are on board. They would even wish that this project is expanded into five IGAD countries. That is what they would wish done, so that the comparative analysis really fits into the UN framework that they are trying to, to that they have adopted and would like to implement. So we are together, working together, moving every step together, but we are looking for funds. What we have is just seed money. We are appealing to our friends and partners that we have a good idea here. Others have looked at it and felt that it is a good idea. And for us to be supported to do all those things that we have presented to you, we are hoping that uh, we will get support so that we can implement them effectively and efficiently. So the partnership is solid. We are signing MOUs after we have looked at other finer details uh, tomorrow and the day after uh, with IGAD and, uh, and PeaceNet. And IDRC knows about this. So I also want to congratulate PeaceNet for expanding through this project. This is uh, an achievement to you, Sam, uh, a very big achievement, because when you expand like this and get that kind of recognition uh, at the national level and also community level, it is very good. Uh, it is also good for us at Austria for making it happen in that manner. So we are celebrating this, all of us. You should do something the Kenyan way about it. Thank you very much. Interaction, an interaction that produces an inception report. And so you cannot go away from here without a methodology. Yeah. You got it. And I'm saying that if this is an interaction that produces an inception report, you've got to be courageous and take a decision about what your methodology is going to be. And I can see that it's a difficult research to design a methodology for. Mm. But you have to take a decision. If you go away from here on Friday and you still haven't cast in stone what your methodology is, then 
you're doing yourself an injustice. I want to make a recommendation. Now, first of all, you've even gone to the extent of suggesting you want to go and interview convicts in prison. In my thinking, even the idea that the various security teams from Kenya that you have mentioned are part of the research would deter some people from giving you information on the ground, giving you accurate information on the ground, because they do not know whether that information can victimize them, notwithstanding your assurance that they will not be victimized. I can, I can see a lot of people in Mwani here, if you're doing Nairobi, in uh, places in Mombasa, who the moment they hear that you're talking to uh, internal security and so on, will not even want to interact with you. But at the same time, I think that either you approach this from a household survey and just assume that households will know somebody who went into extremism and give you some idea of what the issues were, or that you do a purpose of sample and use the connections of this and get this and to identify people who are, actually, who are known to have been involved. It's, it's more time consuming, but get people who are known to have been involved, which means that you're going to use a smaller sample. But in my opinion, you must have a survey so that you can do the X percent and this percent and that percent, rather than just saying that a large number of the focus group that came from and said this and so on. You're trying to come up with issues about how or why CB has not worked, how it has not connected with the people it's supposed to address, and so on and so forth. You want, you want very specific information about what are the actual impediments. We've gone through these questions today, this afternoon, and we've made some general statements about what we think are happening. But to the best of my knowledge, nobody here has been a violent extremist. And maybe the nearest you got to one is through your, your research as a researcher at the uh, University of Madison and so on, and uh, through uh, this kind. But you want information from the horse's mouth. And so you want to get as close to the people who have interacted with these people who have been violent extremists as possible to find out what motivated them. Their families will know, their friends will know, their communities will know. What motivated them to join? When they came back, how did they feel, and so on and so forth. What can be done to stop more people going out there? There's a lot of information there, out there. You heard even something like Dwayne saying, we know these terrorists, why don't you come and ask us? It is a fact that they know those terrorists. So talking to the households, to the community where some of these people are believed to have come from, will be enough to give you some survey data that you can triangulate with key informant interviews, focus group discussions, and that's certainly data from existing literature to come up with some of the issues that you'd like to come up with. If you don't do a household survey, I don't think you're going to get very good uh, quality data. But I think to expect that you're going to talk to a convict who pleaded not guilty and was sent to prison still pleading not guilty, and that they'll give you correct information about what really happened, you'll be lucky. So I think that is something that you owe yourself. Come away from this interaction with a clear statement of what, your, of what your methodology is so that you can work on issues of raising resources and so on, where, where you can give a document to somebody that this is the study that we want to do. I'm really surprised that you got a research permit from Nakosti here and you have not shown them questionnaires. I've done research for so many years and the first thing that Nakosti asks you for is where are the instruments you're going to work with. So you're very lucky to have got those things without that, that address CVE. But I think, just speaking up from what Professor has raised, I think again the question is, we, as a country, of course, we have the NCTC uh, that is charged with that uh, mandate mm -hmm. at a national level. Uh, but then, of course, we also have a national policy of CVE, which, again, very many Kenyans are not very aware of. Yeah. And so, again, just to, uh, perhaps in my opinion, I know the mandate is quite expanded, but if we can expand that output uh, so that we don't limit it to government, because I know you will go to uh, those counties and you may not get much in terms of what the government and NCTs are doing at that level. And, and again, you also have other initiatives that have been spearheaded by civil society organizations, SUKEM, Interreligious Council, CJPC, and other entities, uh, especially towards addressing the issue of CVE. So perhaps just expanding that output slightly to uh, go beyond just what government is doing and also looking at what other agencies and organizations are doing to address the aspect of CVE. Thank you.
which was saying how has the impl implementation of youth and gender policies by governments affected CV practice. I thought uh, one would say about preparation. The government has not done that even to the past experience we had with post-election violence. Number two, the justice uh, on those who have committed crimes, some of them walk without any punishment meted on them, and this can also encourage extremism. Thank you. Mm. Question two, but that, that you know, question two was addressing, which is in tandem with question three. I think there's, in my view, there's a lot of this jointedness even in terms of the work that, that we do along CV and, and other related works uh, and therefore it hampers our, our effectiveness in that area but I also realize that uh, even as we come up with very nice strategies there is a, de a very deliberate effort even by government for example to fund some of these very good interventions that we come up with uh, and therefore it militates against the, the very action that we propose to be undertaken my last one is on um, what Dr. Tufena was sharing, uh, and she was asking us to share some works that have been done. And, and I, I realize there's a lot that has been done. Uh, the number of agencies that have done uh, you know, some assessments around this area. Uh, you realize in our, in our group four, we were saying we need a national assessment, a national mapping. Because uh, then I know the organizations like ACT, uh, ACT Change and Transform, have done a bit of assessments in cost. Uh, you see, these are all disjointed efforts, of course, building to the bigger picture. Uh, UN Women did, did a study, I think it was validated towards, oh, it was validated early this year. Uh, UN Women, it's something they did. I'm not sure that they have. It was last year. Yes. Uh, NCTC themselves are doing another study this time. If not commencing next month, it should be very soon. The National Counterterrorism Center, they'll be doing an assessment on, on the same. Uh, it, it, it all depends on which area of focus, you know, uh, thematic areas that we are focusing in the, in the study. UNDP, of course, supported NCTC by coming up with a, you know, uh, I think it was being called fact-finding study for cost uh, that informed the larger project that is being implemented now. And I think, if I'm not wrong, the soup chemists have also done something. So there's a lot of work happening around us, but we need to get hold of it and see what is it that contributes to the bigger picture. And I think um, there was a time the University of Nairobi uh, Institute for Development Studies, or, or is it uh, it is, uh, with, with you know in partnership with the African Policy Institute. We had a very nice conference here. It was a regional forum. We got were there all these developing partners, and we were looking, uh, talking about a study to develop a, a, a grand African strategy. Or is it an African grand strategy on CBE? Uh, I don't know whether Dr. Tari has any information as to that, or, uh, but I believe this is still something in the works. Uh, I'm just mentioning this so that we know uh, the, the terrain that surrounds all of us. We can flip flop and get to see where the information is. And, and also build synergy and, and comparative uh, you know, advantages as we plan our own. Thank you very much. With some snippets from our content today, what we discussed, uh, maybe in context, but maybe I'm also wrong, they are not so much in context. My question is about the funding for this particular project. Let me double check if I got that all right. Um, when Dr. Trofena gave us some history, some background on the genesis of Osrea. I remember she said it was born out of the realization that many of the, re or all of the research in Africa was actually done by foreigners. And it, there was this, uh, this urge to have it done by Africans, which I can very much understand. The next thing that I see in context with that is um, Professor Sunday, when he said that the issue of violent extremism cannot be overlooked anymore by any actor, it has just become too, too big and too pressing in the recent past. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand the funds 
for this um, research comes from Canadian government. So, and then also you also called, you asked for additional funding for this program, which is also understandable. So this all brings me to the question, where are the governments of Kenya and Uganda? Wouldn't they also have, wouldn't, shouldn't they also have an, their very own interest to support this program, not only strategically, but also financially? Uh, explanation. We, as African scholars, we really uh, pray that our governments embrace the idea of funding research. Even at the university level, un research is underfunded. In fact, it is like nobody really cares about it. And it feels very bad. Most of the uh, funds for African scholars, uh, uh, most African scholars are usually supported either from the north or from the east or uh, f from Latin America or something like that, which um, they have written so much and talked about it in almost every forum. Uh, I usually go to, I, us I hear this. But even when we approach our embassies about these issues, they do not allocate any money for research. So my appeal to you is that please consider helping us out in this particular endeavor.